for me, I can't begin to express the emotions that I'm feeling right now. I am honored, humbled, and hopeful. Honored that you have elected me to lead this great union. As our allies appreciate and our adversaries admit, the AFT has always been not only the best, but the first. The first to fight for collective bargaining. The first to embrace education reform. The first to unite teachers with all the employees in our schools. The first to build a union of professionals, from our public schools to our colleges and universities, our hospitals and healthcare facilities, and our state and local government agencies. And perhaps, most proudly, one of the first to oppose racial segregation in America's schools and in the trade union movement, even going as far as expelling our segregated locals. <laughs> the naysayers told us we couldn't, wouldn't, or shouldn't do these things that no one has ever attempted before, but we showed them that a union of professionals can accomplish anything to which we apply our muscles and our minds, our hearts and our souls. But make no mistake, the society we serve, the institutions where we work, and the workforce that we all represent are changing at speeds we never envisioned. Yet the AFT has always been about making change work for us and not against us. <laughs> Leadership for and in a changing environment has always been our heritage, and we will make it our future. <laughs> Together with Tony and Loretta, our newly elected officers, I promise you this. The AFT will always be the union that confronts injustice, embraces the excluded, questions conventional wisdom, challenges the status quo, and works 24-7 to improve the institutions where our members work. No matter what, we will fight for what is right for the kids and the communities we serve in the manner that respects the dignity of the hard-working people we are honored to represent. Like almost all of you, I came of age in an America with more material comfort but less of a spirit of community than the generations before us. Many of the ideals and institutions that our parents and predecessors held sacred can no longer be taken for granted. The labor movement, which lifted working people into the middle class, is berated by hostile politicians, battered by unscrupulous employers, and beset by economic, social, and technological change. The public schools, which prepare 90% of America's children for productive citizenship, are at a risk of being demonized de-unionized and privatized. And public service, the very idea of serving the common good that is central to our democracy, is being challenged by those who contend that the business of America is business and the best thing government can do is nothing. As a union of public service employees, we are public enemy number one for those who take pot shots at the public schools, the labor movement, and the very concept of government serving a greater good. We have often been called a special interest, and I will never apologize for that because our special interests are the students we teach, the patients we care for, and all the people we serve. for with every weapon in our arsenal as a union of professionals. The power of a growing membership, the power of collective bargaining, the power of the political process, and the power of our ideas 
for improving the institutions where we work. We, my friends, are more than 1.4 million members strong. And I'd emphasize that word strong because every member, every local union, every state federation, and every occupational sector of the AFT is stronger because we stand alongside our sisters and brothers in other places, other professionals, and other public services. That is why we are greater than one. We must demand dignity in our work lives and security in our financial lives, but we also aspire to quality in the services that we provide. And the AFT will always give voice to our members' aspirations to do their best work and to overcome every obstacle to doing the best that you can. That is what binds us together as a union, person by person, profession by profession, sector by sector. If you are a teacher concerned with lowering class sizes, if you are a nurse fighting for adequate staffing levels, if you are a college faculty member trying to save the professoriate, if you are a school aide seeking respect as part of the team of your school, or if you are a state employee struggling against cutbacks and contracting out, then you share the same values, you're fighting the same battles, and you have a natural home in the same union, the AFT. That is why, as our first priority, Tony Loretta and I will lead the development of an AFT reform agenda that involves all AFT members in, in improving the lives and prospects of children and their families, especially those in greatest need. This agenda will embrace everything AFT members do early child care education, K-12 education, higher education, health care, and public services of all kinds. Our most urgent priority is overhauling the federal education law that for many AFT members has become a four-letter word. And you know what those letters are. N C. L. B. We didn't all feel that way at first, and neither did our allies. No Child Left Behind began as a bipartisan effort to close the gaps in educational achievement and complete the unfinished business of the 21st century, of the 20th century. That agenda was defined by two transformative events that embodied the purposes of public education purposes we were proud of then and should be proud of now. The historic decision by the United States Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education declared that this nation would settle for nothing less than universal access. And the groundbreaking report, 1983 report, that is, a nation at risk, affirmed that we should accept nothing less than universal attainment. We believed in high standards, and we still do. We believed in bringing out the best in all children, and we still do. For years, we tried to correct what was wrong with NCLB, but now we know better. NCLB does not work. <laughs> By misdefining, not mystifying, but misdefining achievement, relying too heavily on paper and pencil tests, narrowing and dumbing down the curriculum, and stressing sanctions over supports, NCLB has become a blunt instrument for attacking, not assisting, our public schools. This, look, the sad fact is NCLB is not about teaching, it's about testing. New York City elementary school teachers tell us they spend more time doing test prep than teaching science and social studies combined. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in accountability. And tests, if they are fair and accurate and aligned with a rich curriculum, 
can play an important role in holding teachers, administrators, and schools accountable for much of student achievement. But the narrow numerical measures of NCOB benefit no one, least of all the children they were supposed to help. These are the children who have the least opportunity outside the schoolhouse walls to be exposed to all the elements of a well-rounded education, the arts and physical fitness, the ability to think critically and argue logically, the value of active citizenship, and a knowledge of different people and places. NCOB slams the schoolhouse door on much of what makes up modern civilization and replaces it with multiple choice questions. We need to prepare our students for 21st century jobs. Employers say they are looking for workers who can devise new solutions. But how will kids who have spent 12 years learning to keep their pencil marks inside the bubble, ever be able to think outside the box. And what about our non-college-bound students? NCLB's test-driven curricular has meant a neglect of the technical and higher-order thinking skills that could prepare these students for jobs in the knowledge economy. NCOB has outlived whatever usefulness it ever had. Conceived by accountants, drafted by lawyers, and distorted by ideologues, it is too badly broke to be fixed. What we need and what we seek is a new vision of schools for the 21st century, a vision that truly commits America to closing the achievement gap once and for all and the accountability to ensure this happens. Accountability that is meant to fix schools, not to fix blame. Accountability that recognizes that student, teacher, and school success means much more than producing high scores on two tests a year. Accountability that holds everyone responsible for doing their share, including school districts and states and the federal government, which must provide the necessary resources. And accountability that takes into account the conditions that are beyond the teacher's or the school's control. If student success and accountability are the challenges, then NCOB is not the answer. The answer is to make our schools work for all our children, to do all we can to ensure that all our children have the opportunity to reach their God-given potential. Can you imagine if, as part of that vision, the federal education law, instead of being punitive, was actually positive. If it helped to promote both proven and promising models of education reform. Can you imagine a federal education law that promoted community schools? Schools that serve the neediest children by bringing together under one roof all the services and activities they and their families need. Imagine schools that are open all day and offer after-school and evening recreational activities and homework assistance. High schools that allow students to sign up for morning, afternoon, or evening classes. And suppose, for a moment, the schools included child care, dental, medical and counseling clinics, or other services the community needs. For example, they might offer neighborhood residents English language instruction. GED programs or legal assistance. And can you imagine if cities like Chicago, Philadelphia, Washington, D.C., and others where mayors control the schools actually use that power to integrate services on behalf of kids? Imagine a federal education law that doesn't narrow the curriculum, but instead, as Tony Cortese has often said, assures that every child learns to read 
by being exposed to a rich core curriculum. Imagine a law that encourages districts to assure teacher quality by paying competitive salaries and devising career ladders and other professional compensation models that support great teachers and keep them teaching. Imagine a law that promotes professional development embedded in the job, mentoring for new educators and pure coaching for those who are struggling. Imagine if the staff had common planning time across the disciplines and a collaborative, respectful relationship between staff and administrators. Imagine, in other words, a law that supports the great work of some of our own locals, like the teacher recruitment and retention strategies at the AF ABC School District in California, the Lead Teacher Program in New York City, or the Peer Review Programs in Toledo, Rochester, and Cincinnati. You can all clap for yourselves. Now imagine if our schools had the education resources we had long advocated, like quality pre-K, smaller classes, up-to-date materials, and a nurturing atmosphere so no child feels anonymous. That kind of commitment is what American schools need to provide equity and excellence for every child to make education a civil right as the AFT has long championed. It is a commitment worth fighting for, and we are fighters. But we can't do it alone, and that's why this year's elections are so essential. We believe in accountability in the schoolhouse and in the White House. The Bush administration. It's transformed prosperity into recession, turned historic surpluses into horrendous deficits, brought us eight years of stagnant incomes for everyone but their rich friends, left our school districts and state governments drowning in red ink, left an American city underwater, and bungled a war that never should have been fought in the first place. That crowd loves to talk about accountability, so let's hold them accountable for their record and send them back to the private sector that they claim to love so much. Yesterday, we enthusiastically endorsed Barack Obama for president, and I have no doubt we will work enthusiastically to make him president. And those of us who supported Hillary Clinton will fight just as fiercely for Barack Obama. The choice is clear. Barack Obama says he, we need to overhaul NCLB. John McCain wants more of the same. Obama wants to invest in our public schools. McCain supports private school vouchers. Obama wants to invest in health insurance for all Americans, including every child. McCain voted against extending health benefits to children and wants to tax workers who still have employer-paid health care benefits from their employers. Barack Obama and John McCain offer two very different records, two very different philosophies, and two very different visions for America's future. Senator Obama will make history not only because of who he is, but because of where he will lead America. So, can we elect a president who shares our vision and values? As Barack Obama would say, yes, we can. Our adversaries have looked at the challenges confronting this country from struggling schools to stagnant wages and repeated the big lie that organized educators, healthcare professionals, and the public service employees are the problem. We need to put forth the simple but powerful truth that far from being the problem, 
a progressive and innovative union like the AFT is part of the solution. We in the AFT believe that professionals who serve the public have a crucial contribution to make, not just in making sure that services are delivered, but in making changes that ensure that services are delivered better than ever. Because the people who do the work care more than anyone else, know more than anyone else, and can do more than anyone else about improving the public services that America counts on. Our members know what works and what doesn't work, what to keep and what to change, and our union gives voice to their heartfelt aspirations and practical proposals for doing their best work for the people they serve. Whether the issue is ed reform, health care reform, governmental reform, these efforts will be doomed to failure unless they are built on a foundation of respect for the professionals who do the work. But when you give professionals the respect, the recognition, and the rewards that they rightfully deserve, there is no limit to what they can accomplish. So we say to the public officials and administrators, if you're searching for partners to improve public institutions, the union is the solution. And we say to parents and taxpayers, if you want better public schools, better colleges, better hospitals, and better state governments, the union is the solution. And most of all, we say to all of you and everyone we are honored to represent, educators, nurses, and all those who serve the public. If you want the dignity you deserve, the security you demand, and the quality you dream of, the union is the solution. We are grateful to those who built this union, made it part of the fabric of American life, and passed it along to us. But the AFT is not an inheritance. It is an achievement that every generation of activists must renew in response to the challenges of their times. Sisters and brothers, our challenges are great, but our cause is just. Our numbers are growing and our moment is now. Let's make the most of it. Thank you.